um, the Big Friday game. Um, and it was a absolutely fascinating match. Um, I think it lived up to what we hoped for. Uh, both of us actually got this result right, 2-2, right? Um, but it, the way we got there was overly dramatic. Um, Bayern took the lead, uh, deservedly took the lead. Um, I would say that at that moment, I was really worried about Leverkusen to, to do what many other Bundesliga teams do when they go down in Munich is to completely collapse. They actually didn't and came back to to equalize. That Palacios free kick might be an early contender for the goal of the season. Um, sorry, yes, Grimaldo. Yes, you're right. Not Kevin Palacios, Grimaldo. Uh, Palacios scored the equalizer eventually to make it 2-2 from the spot. That's the one. Um, that was a late equalizer. Alfonso Davies with the foul in the box on Hoffman. Um, lots to talk about here as well. I think there was a lot of debate on whether that was too soft or not too soft. I personally think if you tackle someone like that in the box, you're asking for trouble. Was it soft? I agree with that as well. I think it was soft, but just don't go there, right? It's like, what, the 95th minute of a game? Just don't go there. Um, but Stefan, I think the bottom line is no matter how we got there, I think this was a very deserved two to draw in the end. And I was actually kind of impressed by both teams. I think this was a really high tempo game. It's great advertising for the Bundesliga. And I walk away from this match thinking, yeah, Leverkusen are for real. Yeah, absolutely. It, it definitely was great um, advertising for the league. Certainly here in the UK, where it was on Friday night. Um, I don't think there was a big Premier League game on at the same time. Um I, I knew that more people were paying attention to because I had my brother text me towards the end of the second half just going absolutely nuts at how good the game was and I met him the next day because uh, I went along to watch Queen's Park team in Glasgow on Saturday and you know, he came along as well. He would not stop talking about how amazing the game had been. Uh, so, you know, you know it's good when neutrals or people who don't even follow the league kind of tune in and enjoy it. And it was. It was great. It was a great... It was. I, I was going to say it was end to end. I wouldn't go as far as say it was end to end. I guess it was at times, but I think it was it was more the sense that both teams kind of had periods of of possession. Um, you know, both teams were able to exert their tactics at certain points. Key players kind of stood up. I saw someone say it was. It felt a lot like a kind of Champions League kind of quarter final or semi final. I, I completely agree with that sentiment. Um, it, it it felt like two very evenly matched teams, and I think that's a huge obviously. A huge credit to Bayer Leverkusen. You can go through the stats, and they certainly back it up. You know, in terms of XG, from at least the the model I'm using here, um, Bayern's XG was two point seven, Leverkusen's was two point three eight. So very similar there. Possession fifty one percent to forty nine percent. Penalty box shots twelve to Bayern, nine to Leverkusen. Deep completion passes. So that's piece. That's kind of passes that make it into the six yard box. 15 to Bayern, 19 to Leverkusen, and yeah, I think the game definitely kind of went back and forth. It had periods where Bayern were on top, had periods where Leverkusen were on top. I actually kind of walked away from that first half wondering, you know, there's, there's that kind of age-old kind of saying in football that the only thing worse than conceding a goal in the first 20 minutes is scoring a goal in the first 20 minutes because... You kind of get complacent, uh, you kind of sit back, you can, and then you eventually let the other team in because they're obviously pushing, try equalising. I mean, that Harry Kane goal was the biggest gift that anyone's going to get all season. You know, I think it hits off Kosono's head maybe, and Kane's completely unmarked to the back post, and he just taps it, and he's not going to score an easier goal than that this season. Um, but it meant Leverkusen really had to go up a gear, and they had to really begin to exert themselves in the match, and I thought they did that for a large chunk of the game. Uh, I thought it was really interesting. One stat I found really interesting was uh, when you look at both teams' high turnovers, so basically like when they dispossessed the opposing team in the opposing team's half, Bayern did that to Leverkusen five times, but Leverkusen did that to Bayern seven times. And in terms of it leading to a shot, Bayern's never led to a shot, but Leverkusen seven, all the seven, three led to a shot for Leverkusen. And I think for a long period of the game, they did such a good job of really kind of containing Bayern for the most part you know um, I've got Leverkusen's pass map open in front of me and it's essentially like a back three um, with two very very wide uh, fullbacks obviously in Grimaldo and Frimpong actually Frimpong is the second highest player in the park in terms of average position 
And then you've kind of got Florian Wurtz trying his best to play off Boniface. Um, but I think the key thing is you kind of have those three central midfielders, um, Xhaka, uh, obviously Andrik, and then um, later on, uh, you know, you mentioned Palacios there. With them sitting so kind of neatly in the middle of the park there, and then that back three uh, of Jonathan Ta, Kosono, and oh, I'm trying to remember, and Tapsoba, of course, um, you had like a block of five or six players there who were just doing such a great job of kind of, uh, you know, basically protecting the goal now from Harry Kane. And I think what was maybe quite telling was, and I think what really showed the way that Bayern were kind of forced to play Leverkusen's game was the manner in which the kind of first three games of the season we've played, we've seen Leroy Sané playing very close to Harry Kane and Serge Gnabry play very close to Harry Kane. And I think Thomas Tuchel's general idea is that these two players play off Kane the way that Son played off Kane at Tottenham. But if you watch the game back and even the highlights, you'll see that Leroy Sané often not has to come out very wide or very deep to pick up the ball. And I think that's probably a testament to Bayern, uh, to, Le- to Leverkusen rather, they're marking, they're closing down, they're keeping a very tight block. Um... And for the most part, they did a good job of kind of limiting um, Barnes' chances. Of course, both teams did have chances. You know, for example, Serge Gnabry should, probably should have scored in the first half. Uh, I thought Boniface maybe should have scored one or two extra goals as well in the second half. But it was a great game. Uh, it was a fantastic kind of show of what these both sides can do. But I think, more or less, Xabi Alonso was able to walk away from this match and say, my tactics worked in the Allianz Arena against Bayern Munich, and I think that's a huge, huge plus for him and something that probably drove Thomas Tuchel crazy, as we saw full time where he was basically escorted off the pitch. Yeah, and Joel Glöw uh, with a red card at the end as well, um, his assistant coach, right? Um, you mentioned Boniface, eight shots, um, the most of any player, um, didn't score. I think his best moment was actually when he played that one-two with Wirtz and Wirtz then hit the post, um, which I think probably would have been the winner at that point. Of course, Leon Goretzka then did score what looked the winner on the other side shortly after. And that was off Matthias Tell. And I actually thought that was a really good uh, substitution by um, Thomas Tuchel uh, to bring in Matthias Tell, um, who is increasingly developing at Bayern Munich despite limited minutes. I think... Actually, his development plan is quite good, which is probably you know something that we can look at um, in more details later on. But yeah, Boniface was a player who I thought just didn't have the best day. <laughs> you know, he had, he played. I think he actually got into all the right spaces. He 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 got a lot of shots off. Um, just didn't hit the target often enough, and um, you actually almost wonder if you a Leverkusen fan. Maybe we could have done better um, here because, you know, if we don't have a misfiring striker, and I I, I don't think this is on Boniface at all, you, you will have players that will have games like that. And I'm sure that, you know, the next game comes along and all of a sudden it will click again. But when you're in the Allianz Arena, you got to take those chances. And the fact that they got away with eight chances created by Boniface and still walk away with a point, I think that is, a, that's a, in my opinion, a pretty big takeaway, Stefan, because not many teams create that many chances at the Allianz Arena without scoring and still walking away with a point. Yeah, I thought Boniface was really interesting in this game. We were discussing it in our group chat um, during the match, and I said, uh, I think just before he did that really nice one-two with Furt, so I said, Maybe it's about time to bring him off because I thought he was beginning to get quite isolated from the rest of the team because Leverkusen were maybe sitting deeper. And, you know, he, but he was still capable of kind of pulling off these moments of magic. He's obviously such a huge, strong forward, you know, and that kind of physical battle between him and Opamecano was just fascinating um, because we've seen that, we saw that a lot last season with Erling Haaland in the sense that, or maybe not last season, season before, I suppose now, um, where. If you have a kind of big striker that can that can match with Meccano's strength and pace, he does begin to almost panic. And I mean, at times the two of them look like they're playing like kind of like they're they're actually like like wrestling, like Olympic wrestling or something. In the sense they had their arms over each other. Um, but I thought Boniface came over a lot of the times. Um, you know, managed to get past him, for example. Uh, and then you said only for his composure to kind of fail him. Um, Another aspect of that as well, I thought, and this was obviously a huge game part, a, a huge game plan was the way that Wurtz and Boniface were meant to play off each other. Um, and throughout the match, I was just constantly amazed at how much how much space Florian Wurtz was given behind that Bayern midfield. You know, 
spent all summer talking about the need for Bayern to sign a defence midfielder and you know Thomas Tuchel's been on the record talking about you know Joshua Kimmich is in at number six and whether Leon Goretzka was going to get back into the team and then Ryan Gravenberg gets sent uh, sold and then Conrad Leimer gets moved to right back and you know the preview our preview to this game we talked a lot about if Joshua Kimmich can't start in this match then Bayern are in real trouble unless you know someone like Matthijs De Ligt can maybe play there but you know, Kimmich plays, maybe not 100% fit. Goretzka's obviously a much more of a kind of more of an attacking presence. Um, and I thought Verts really had the run of it in the Bayern midfield for the most part. And in, in, in the Bayern half, rather. The only thing I think let him down was his final ball. We saw time and time again, he picked up the ball. He had chances to run at that defence. Um, maybe he only really had one option in the sense that Boniface was maybe the only one that's kind of played off. And of course, Frimpong kind of can keep up as well, but it felt, I was a wee bit disappointed and to be perfectly honest with you, just in that sense, his final pass is very lacking. And so much so that I actually kind of wondered, I think I maybe tweeted this during the game, that I wondered if he was a little jaded from a you know a heavy international break uh, where he obviously he featured for Germany. So, you know, Boniface obviously maybe a few centimetres away from, you know, winning the game for Leverkusen. But also, I think if Wurtz had maybe spent less time playing for Germany... Uh, he might have been a little sharper and he could have he could have really put that Bayern defence to the sword and obviously that's something that Bayern will have to be wary of when they play bigger and better teams, particularly in Europe uh, going forward. But that that tactically, that was the one thing that really stood out to me. Another thing as well, which and we did talk about this on the preview show and it, and it did end up playing out, was that Alfonso Davies, I thought, had a really poor game in a sense that you know he was really pinned back by Frimpong and obviously he could see the penalty towards the end and I think, you know, as we said in the previous show, I think if you if you do have a player who's capable of kind of going toe-to-toe with um, Davies and, you know, throughout the match, you watched Frimpong and he was almost shadowing Davies to an extent. And if you look at his average position, as I said a moment ago, he was the second highest player in the Leverkusen team because he's basically standing on Davies' toes. Um, and that did such a good job of kind of limiting Bayern's attack as well. So, yeah, like I said, you know, Bayern had their chances to win the game. Leverkusen had their chances to win the game. But I think overall, Leverkusen just did a really good job of containing this Bayern team and they made it a very frustrating night for them. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the uh, Upamecano's issues when he plays for, against a um, you know, stronger striker. The other one that comes to mind is Marcus Turam um, for Gladbach, right? Will always cause some trouble. Um, the, the Davies... Yeah, I think that, you know, this wasn't his best game. And you just look at Frimpong's stats, right, throughout the match. Um, he actually clocked the, the highest speed playing against Davies, right, um, of any player on the field. The fastest Bayern player was Leroy Sané. Um, and I I think that tells you quite a bit of what Alonso did at this match. Um, he looked at the Bayern side and said, okay, look, these are the, these are the areas that we need to eliminate for us to be successful here and um as you said you know putting Frimpong on on Davies and kind of challenging him with with this high speed kind of attack basically giving eliminating Davies its strengths which allows Davies to play so far forward right because he's so fast by giving by putting someone on the opposite side who's just as fast and I think if you're an opponent and you look at that you say hey this is actually this is something that works right um the the penalty, of course, he gives that away. Um, just don't go there. I've said this before. And I thought, too, the whole Joshua Kimmich situation, I thought was quite fascinating. Because I was told before the match that he wasn't fit, right? Um, this was a club source, right? Joshua Kimmich had different ideas. Um, he was quite upset about the substitution, um, wanted to continue playing. The medical staff had determined from what they've seen and what they found that 60 minutes was the max of what they gave him. Um, there's a lot of politics around Joshua Kimmich at the moment, Stefan, which I, I personally found extremely fascinating. The indication was that he would have been fit enough to come off the bench for that Germany friendly. He didn't, right? Um, I think there's a symbolism symbolism there, whatever you want to make out of that, um, that, you know, when Gundogan came off, um, Germany opted with Pascal Groß and then opted not to leave him there, essentially, even though he would have been fit enough to play some minutes. And then he comes off here and 
Bayern didn't really drop off, right? I mean, Leon Goretzka scores off that Matisse tell. Um, there's a brief moment, and symbolism is so important when it comes around Bayern Munich. There's this, there's the celebration where Kimi runs onto the field and celebrates with his buddy Goretzka, right? Um, which would have probably been a great picture if Bayern had won the match. Now it's just going to go and be lost in eternity. But then um, today these photos emerge with Joshua Kimmich and Hassan Salihamidzic at the Oktoberfest. And look, he's a smart guy. He knows that if he's with Hassan Salihamidzic at the Oktoberfest, that will go to the press. That will be leaked to Brill. Brill Bill published it, of course, moments later. My point is there's a lot of noise around him at the moment. And if you're Bayern Munich and you have a pretty big game coming up against Manchester United, that's the last thing you want. Yeah, I mean, it's FC Hollywood at its best. October, it, it's it's crazy that Bayern still do this Oktoberfest photo shoot because it always comes back to bite them in the ass. Uh, you know, last season there was that kind of infamous photo of Sajamovic well, and have to add, this is not This is not the... Uh, Stefan, this is not the official shoot. This is him up as a private visit. Sure. So well, I mean, it's it's never private, is it? Let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Munich's not. Yeah. I know Munich's a big city, but it's also a small town in a lot of ways. Um, so you know, yeah. like especially when Oktoberfest comes along. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. and like so, like I was saying, like you know, every single year there seems to be at least one photo taken that just causes chaos at bar. And last season. It was that kind of hilarious photo of I think I think it was Oliver Kahn, uh, Sajamovic, and maybe the club president all sitting uh, around a table with their partners, not a smile amongst them. Uh, and Nagelsmann. And Nagelsmann, yeah. And then I think the year before there was a photo yeah. of Nagelsmann with his new girlfriend shortly after break up his wife, yes. and sh she was the reporter for Build, which caused all sorts of issues as well. I think so. It's just. It's always something at Bayern. Um, and of course, if things are going well, it's not an issue. But when they're not going well, it is an issue. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Kimmich continues to be a huge issue in Germany. I saw Michael Ballack. He uh, was quoted in the maybe kicker saying that, um, you know, Kimmich is a world-class right back, but he's not a world-class central midfielder. Um, and he has to go back to that position. So it's it's an issue. And it's always going to be an issue until, you know, Bayern kind of really saw that midfield out and figure out a way to get, you know, Kimmich and Goreska playing like they maybe used to do. Whether they can or not, I guess it's up for debate and it's up to Tuchel to kind of figure out if he can. But I guess we just have to wait and see what happens. But like I said, these these stories and these pictures and these quotes from pundits only really surface and become a thing when these guys aren't performing on the pitch. It's all just noise. Uh, and if they are performing on the pitch, no one really pays attention to it. So. I guess it's up to Kimmich and Tuchel to figure out a way to get past this.